Well, Ambassador Gray joined the faculty of the Naval War College in July uh, 2012. He had been the U.S. Ambassador to Tunisia from 2009 to 2012, witnessing the start of the Arab Spring and directing the U.S. response in support of Tunisia's transition. Previously, he served as, in Iraq as a senior advisor to the ambassador, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, where his responsibilities included promotion of U.S. interests in North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, and oversight of the Bureau's Regional Affairs Office. Other foreign assignments include Egypt, where he served as Deputy Chief of Mission from 2002 to 2005, Canada, Jordan, Pakistan, and Morocco, where, coincidentally, he began his government career as a Peace Corps volunteer. Gray is a member of the Middle East Institute and the American Foreign Service Association, and he has twice received the Presidential Meritorious Service Award. He received his BA from Yale University and an MA from Columbia. Today, he'll be speaking on the Arab Uprising, Implications for U.S. Policy. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Gordon Gray. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for coming uh, at your uh, lunchtime hour. Whoops. <laughs> I was going to talk about this brilliant slide. Uh, there we go. And uh, this is a picture taken in, uh, in Tahrir Square in, in Cairo. And I, I like it for a few reasons. Um, one, this, uh, the phrase on the banner, people demand uh, the removal of the regime. Uh, for those of you who speak Arabic, you'll know it sounds a bit catchier in Arabic, but it's uh, a slogan that began in, uh, in Tunisia during the uh, protests there, spread to Cairo. It's been used elsewhere. The, um, the demonstrators, the uh, young kids actually who scrawled uh, uh, in this slogan in gra graffiti in, in um, Dara in, uh, in Syria were were arrested uh, for putting this putting this on the wall, and that's the uh, really the spark of what happened there. And I understand it was even chanted during um, uh, during the Occupy Wall Street uh, uh, demonstration. So it's got uh, quite a quite a pedigree, if uh, if you will. What I'd like to do um, this afternoon is talk about some of the contributing factors to what happened in, in Tunisia and elsewhere, and then give you a bit of an analytical framework to frame, frame the Arab Spring so that you can uh, maybe put things in, in perspective. And I'll, in doing that, I'll make a, a detour toward uh, Tunisia, since that's the uh, uh, country I was serving in during the, during the Arab Spring. Talk about some of the variables uh, out there and then also um, some of the uh, unresolved issues, and there are several, and finally time allowing some of the implications for the, um, the United States. Uh, let me start out with, with terminology. There's no perfect uh, phrase to use. Uh, Arab uprising is often used, but that suggests that there haven't been uprisings before when in fact there have been. Uh, you could make the same argument for the term Arab awakening. A uh, uh, scholar named Adi Dawisha, uh, for that reason, entitled his recently published book, The Second Arab Awakening. Uh, I like the term Arab Spring because it uh, gives a suggestion of a, there's certain connotation of, of hope, but it's just as imperfect as the other, the other terms. Um, started in Tunisia in the winter, not in the spring, and we've seen it through all, all four seasons. But however we label these events, there's no question that they've had a profound, uh, uh, profound impact on, not just on the Arab world, but also on, um, on our interests in North Africa and the Middle East. So let me start, as I said, by talking about some of the contributing factors, and I'd say there were, there were four. First one is alienation, and in his uh, 1993 book, uh, Halim Barakat talked about the, the sense of powerlessness, the lack of development of, um, of civil society, and I think all of these contributed to 
um, to the sense of alienation that, that people felt in, uh, uh, in the Middle East. Second um, contributing factor was a much greater uh, and freer flow of, of information. Uh, try as they might, authoritarian rulers could no longer control the free flow of, of information, be it uh, Al Jazeera through the satellite uh, stations or, uh, or the media. And those were both very important. Um, I shouldn't say the media, the internet. Both were very important to what, um, what we saw happen uh, starting two years ago. It's hard to exaggerate the degree to which authoritarian regimes went to try and um, suppress the media. In Tunisia, for example, the Al Jazeera website was blocked, which didn't really make too much sense because you could get it on your satellite television and everybody, uh, everyone was watching it. Uh, YouTube was blocked in, uh, in Tunisia when I was there. Uh, interestingly though, Facebook in Tunisia was not blocked, and uh, the story I, um, I was told when I got to Tunisia was that it, it, it was briefly blocked, and uh, as a result, Ben Ali's granddaughter went in to see him, tears streaming down in her face, saying, Papa, you can't block Facebook. And he was such a magna magnanimous despot that he relented and unblocked it, probably to his chagrin. Uh, uh, stories that are too good to be true usually aren't true, but, uh, and I've never been able to get to the bottom of it, but it's, um, um, I wonder how that granddaughter is viewed in the family, uh, in, the, in the family now. Twitter was not a factor in Tunisia in the uprisings, but it has been very effective in mobilizing folks in, uh, in urban societies. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the demonstrations in Tehran in June 2009, not part of the Arab Spring, but still those, the mobilization we saw there, and also in, in Cairo in January and February 2011, it was, uh, it was definitely a factor. Um, and this is just a sign of folks in, uh, in Tahrir Square, and uh, it, actually it says in Arabic, uh, the, uh, the young people of, uh, of, of Egypt, thank you, uh, thank you, Facebook. Third contributing factor was youth bulge. I can tell when I'm making a point because everyone starts writing it, uh, writing it down. Uh, if, uh, Looking at this chart, you'll see on the, the far right the uh, population, uh, percentage of the population under the age of 25 in the UK, a few years back, 31%, but uh, ranging from 42% in Tunisia to 65% uh, in, uh, uh, in Yemen in, in this chart. This is a uh, picture of a Tunisian rap star who was imprisoned uh, during the the protests uh, there released right before Ben Ali fled, but he uh, he obviously resonated with a with a Tunisian Tunisian youth. Fourth factor was corruption, and um, this is a picture of Ben Ali's son-in-law, who at the time of the revolution was just 29 years old, but was already. Uh, owned the distributorship for Ford, for Mercedes, if I remember correctly. He owned the publishing house that published the largest circulation Arabic and French dailies. He had uh, telecom interests, et cetera, et cetera. And as talented as he may or may not have been, you have to think that it was the family connection rather than his innate business sense that got him to where uh, he was. Um, this is uh, Ben Ali's nephew, Ahmed Trebelsi, who uh, had an equally unsavory reputation. But he, uh, if any of you had any questions about whether Darwin was, was right or not, uh, Sakhar al the, um, the son-in-law, escaped right before the revolution. And he's, uh, he's doing time. Um, Ahmed Trebelsi is doing time now in a Tunisian prison for, uh, for corruptions and facing upcoming uh, corruption, facing upcoming charges. The Tunisian revolution compared to the Syrian revolution was fair, or, or others was, 
was not as violent. There was a loss of life, but not, uh, not anywhere near the scope of what we're seeing in Syria. And there was such anger toward the, the ruling family that their, their houses were very systematically targeted. This house was looted and, and, and burned out, and the, the graffiti, the spray painting that you see, uh, came after the fact. It was teenagers who didn't participate in the revolution but wanted to post a picture on Facebook or something like this, that to show, uh, um, show what, it, uh, what it was. But when you look at uh, all these, four, these factors that I've, that I've outlined, at the end of the day, this uh, quotation, which is something that um, someone who had been a, an activist in civil society uh, before the revolution became a minister in the national unity government, still very actively uh, involved in politics. I put this up because I remember, I remember this so well, and I think it really explains uh, why not just why things happened in, in Tunisia, but why they've, why they've happened elsewhere. It really is loss of dignity and lack of dialogue that just, um, uh, that just didn't, didn't exist. So let me move, if I may, to framing, framing the Arab Spring. And what I'm going to do is set out four different, um, different outcomes. And uh, they've, not surprisingly, unfolded differently in each country. The first uh, group is what I call fleeing de dictators, and degage is, is French slang for scram or, or get out, and it's what Tunisian protesters chanted during their protests, and then um, it, it spread to, to Egypt as well. Some of the Egyptians were, were chanting it as well. In Tunisia, it, um, it started the, on uh, December 17th, 2010, when Mohamed Bouazizi, who was an underemployed university graduate, he was selling fruits and vegetables, a policewoman came up to his uh, cart, asked to see the permit, which she couldn't produce. Uh, there was an exchange of words. She slapped them and confiscated his, his cart, meaning she confiscated his livelihood. He went to City Hall to air his grievances, and no one would, would listen to him. I mean, he was just a just a fruit and vegetable vendor in, in their eyes. And um, as a result, result he um, set himself on, on, on fire. And there was, uh, this struck such a chord that demonstrations, uh, demonstrations began in, um, in Tunisia and, and slowly built. At the embassy, we knew that the regime perceived itself to be in trouble when this photograph was published in, on the front pages of all the newspapers. It's a, uh, a picture of uh, Ben Ali, who's right there, who was then the, the president, the longstanding ruler, visiting Bouazizi in the hotel, in the, uh, sorry, not the hotel, the hospital room. And the idea that someone is as aloof and as uh, authoritarian as uh, as Ben Ali would deign to visit one of his subjects uh, showed that, um, that the regime was very, very worried. And I like this political cartoon because it shows the, kind of the, the full scope of, of what was going on. Obviously, Bouazizi pushing his, his vegetable and fruit cart. Um, the scales used to weigh the vegetables and fruit, I think also there's a nice connotation of the scales of justice and, of course, knocking Ben Ali off, uh, off his, his throne. So the countries that fall in this category, I would say, are, are both Egypt and, uh, and Tunisia, where uh, both the leaders left very quickly, four weeks uh, in the case of Ben Ali and uh, 18 days in, in the case of uh, Mubarak. Both, relatively speaking, homogeneous society, uh, both, both republics. Let me speak a little bit about um, about the Tunisian Revolution in just um, um, in just a bit bit of detail, I'd say it's the first postmodern um, revolution. I give four reasons for that. Uh, first, it wasn't ideological. People were insisting on certain values: transparency, 
uh, rule of law, human rights, but they were not, uh, not pushing a particular, you know, say, communism or, or Islam or uh, nationalism or whatever. Um, as a result, I think after the revolution, there was uh, greater scope for cooperation among, among different groups within Tunisian society. Um, second, it was a grassroots revolution. It was, there were really no leaders. It was from the, the roots, from the, the grassroots up. And that meant that no, no one could claim ownership. No one leader could claim ownership of, uh, of the revolution. Uh, third, social media, as, as we just discussed, played, uh, played a very important role. And then um, fourth, it was a revolution in which the participants did not, um, uh, did not seek to take power themselves. Moving back to framing, framing the revolution, giving a bit of an analytical uh, uh, framework, I, I gave the first category. The second category, uh, I would say, are those republics where they were ruled by authoritarian rulers and they've degenerated into, into civil war. Uh, Syria is perhaps the most obvious example of that of this now, Libya and, uh, and Yemen also fall into that category. One of the th uh, things that characterize all three countries are uh, the heterogeneous nature of the societies. Uh, unlike Tunisia or Egypt, there are um, either significant sectarian divisions, as in the case of Syria, where only uh, where the Alawites are about 12% of the population, or serious tribal uh, fissures, as in the case of Libya and uh, um, and uh, uh, Libya and, and Yemen. Uh, third basket would be those countries that have succeeded in managing change from above. Um, I, Algeria is one of those countries, and there they've been able to apply uh, both a very robust security response and also significant financial resources to uh, um, combating any hint of, of demonstrations. There were some demonstrations, even some self-immolations right after the Tunisian protests started, but the government moved in very quickly to stop them. Uh, the fact that they had such a bloody civil war in the 90s, I think, also dampened popular, uh, any popular interest in, in seeing what could be a replay of that. Uh, Morocco is another country where um, thus far they've been able to manage, um, manage change from above. Uh, the king has been ahead of the reform curve, if you will, since he came to power in 1999. He established, for example, a, um, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and um, expanded women's rights in, uh, in Morocco. He also has a religious legitimacy as a descendant of the prophet that um, some of the other, uh, other leaders, non-monarchs, non can't, uh, can't claim. Following the Arab Spring, he introduced constitutional reforms. They had elections, which led to not only the uh, um, election of an uh, Islamist uh, uh, or Islamist-led parliament, but also uh, an Islamist uh, prime minister as a result. Uh, Jordan is another example of a country that thus far has been able to manage change from above. Um, King Abdullah, like, um, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, King Abdullah, like King Mohammed, uh, has a certain amount of legitimacy, religious legitimacy as a, de um, as a descendant of the, uh, uh, of the prophet. I would say he's been a little bit less successful than the King of Morocco in managing change, but uh, at the same time, I'd also note that the number of demonstrations in, in Jordan seems to have uh, tailed off uh, a bit. Then the fourth, uh, the fourth group of uh, countries are the, the Gulf monarchies, and by and large, they've been able to uh, contain whatever, uh, whatever protests or demonstrations there were, with the exception of, of Bahrain, which has a uh, Shiite majority ruled by a uh, Sunni monarchy, and the Sunnis are uh, in, the, in the minority. Uh, Kuwait has seen a, 
number of demonstrations, but I would argue those were not so much related to Arab Spring as much as the uh, continual uh, push and pull between uh, the ruling family and, and parliament. It's pleased to he hear that my uh, friend and colleague, Ambassador Tour, will be here um, speaking to you next week, and I um, strongly encourage you to, uh, to listen to what, what he has to say. And if you have any hard questions, please save them for, for him, and I'm sure he'll be able to answer them. <laughs> uh, as I said, though, there were very significant demonstrations in, in Bahrain. This is Pearl Roundabout, which is kind of the Tahrir Square, if you will, of, of Bahrain. There were so many demonstrations there that the regime, the monarchy, just pulled down, the, pulled it all together, blocked it off so people couldn't, uh, couldn't access it. Let me move on, if I may, then, to uh, some of the key, uh, key variables. I'd say there are five variables in, that describe how, what the reactions have been. Um, one is the, the nature of the society. In uh, the case of both Egypt and uh, Tunisia, there's a, a sense of history, a sense of nationhood and heritage, and also the Homo homogeneous nature of the, the societies, which, uh, which is very important. Um, second key variable is the, the role of the military. Uh, in the case of Tunisia, this is a picture of the then chief of defense staff. The military played a very apolitical role and moved in to provide security and, in, in fact, um, succeeded in doing so. And this is not a propaganda, <laughs> propaganda photograph from the, uh, uh, from the Tunisian army. And the, the Tunisian military was not at all implicated in any of the human rights abuses of the Ben Ali era, so the people were very pleased to see, see them uh, move in. I saw people go up to tanks right after the revolution and put bouquets of flowers uh, on the tanks and, and things like that. Contrast that to, say, uh, Libya, where you had a mercenary, uh, a mercenary force, which obviously um, had no compunctions about uh, killing Libyan citizens. What we're seeing in, in Syria today um, is, um, is another example. Obviously, the Egyptian military's role in, uh, in politics and in the economy of Egypt uh, continues to this day uh, as well. Third variable is the nature of, of leadership. Uh, people do matter. And, uh, you know, in the case of Ben Ali and, uh, and Mubarak, for all their flaws, they left the scene early on and spared their countries a lot of violence. Um, contrast that, say, with, with Gaddafi, who fought to the end, uh, and, or for that matter, Bashar seems to be doing, uh, doing the same thing. Fourth key variable is, is resources. And uh, I mentioned in the case of Algeria, also in the case of the Gulf monarchies. It's a, they are all in a lot different situation than, say, Ali Abdullah Saleh was in, uh, in Yemen, which is such a, uh, such a poor country. And then a fifth, um, um, a fifth variable that I'd mention is either the regional reaction or the, the international uh, uh, reaction. Uh, in Tunisia, the United States came out uh, very quickly in support of, uh, of the transition. A lot of Tunisians told me that gave them the confidence to move forward. Uh, on the other hand, we can contrast the situations in Libya and, um, and Syria, where international intervention in, in Libya started out with a request from the Gulf Cooperation Council, that moved to the Arab League, that moved to, to the UN Security Council. There's no such, uh, no such consensus for, for Syria. In the case of Bahrain, the other Gulf Cooperation Council members sent uh, military, uh, military force to uh, help put down, uh, put down the protests. There are also a tremendous number of um, of, of unresolved issues that uh, remain, as you can imagine. And one of the things that we all need to uh, t 
take into consideration is how long democracy actually uh, actually takes to to take hold. Uh, democracy is a lot more than than elections. Um, writing a couple of years ago, but right, relatively speaking, right after the demonstrations began, uh, a political scientist named Jack Goldstone at George Mason University told people that they need to, uh, you know, need to take the long, long view and that uh, things weren't going to be resolved in either Tunisia or Egypt uh, uh, overnight. I mean, he said half a decade uh, for consolidation, and even that might be an optimistic, uh, uh, an optimistic uh, uh, prognosis. Let me give you a, a few examples, uh, more specific examples of uh, issues that need to be resolved. Uh, one is freedom of expression. I don't know if any of you have seen Persepolis, which is an animated uh, Franco-Iranian film, but um, some uh, Salafists apparently took uh, or people who are apparently Salafists took umbrage at it being broadcast on uh, Nabil Karawi's Pan Maghreb satellite station, and so they uh, uh, firebombed his house. Fortunately, he and his family weren't injured, but uh, he was convicted of disturbing the public order. And uh, people who firebombed his house went were not uh, not punished. Uh, to make it even more ironic, he was. Uh, he was convicted on, uh, on, or sentenced rather, on May 3rd of, of last year, which is World Press, uh, Press Freedom Day. I don't know if any of you watch, uh, watch The Daily Show. Uh, if you do, you may have seen Bassem Youssef as a guest, but he is an uh, Egyptian satirist who is host of what at least Americans call the, uh, uh, the Egyptian uh, Daily Show. And he was uh, indicted for, but not not convicted of uh, of insulting President uh, President Morsi. So all kinds of things that we take for granted in uh, uh, in the United States are not uh, you know are, are issues that need to be resolved uh, overseas. It reminds me of the story about the Iraqi and the uh, American uh, talking, and and the Americans said we have freedom of speech in our in our country, this is before, uh, you know, this is under Saddam Hussein. We have freedom of uh, speech in our country. I can, uh, you know, say down with President Bush and nothing will happen to me. And the Iraqis say, well, we've got freedom of speech in our country too. I can say down with President Bush and nothing will happen to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> not quite there yet in some of those countries. Um, Equally important is the either inability to or unwillingness to for governments, particularly the um, uh, Islamist-led governments, to confront Salafist violence. Uh, just over a year ago, the embassy in, in Tunisia was attacked. Uh, it's not just a question of attacking uh, embassies, but also um, uh, other religious, uh, uh, re religious symbols. Uh, Sufi shrine attacked by Salafists last year, uh, attacks against Coptic churches in, uh, in, in Egypt as uh, well. And this has escalated in, uh, in Tunisia at least into um, assassinations of uh, two secular uh, opposition leaders. And again, um, governments have not been able to uh, find that that balance between respecting individual rights and and being eager and willing and able to go after uh, after terrorism. Then, yet another fact or another variable is um, uh, civil military relations. Uh, this is in, in Egypt, but as we talked, uh, it, it varies uh, varies country to country. And on top of all of this, you've got the, the very serious economic issues, particularly unemployment. Sidi Bouzid is where uh, Mohamed Bouazizi was from, where he um, committed suicide. And these demonstrations happened two years after that. And they weren't political at all in nature. They were economic. People wanted to know how the revolution had made, made their lives better and, and wanted to press their economic uh, um, their economic grievances. 
So when all is said and done, um, what does this mean for the United States? I think the first thing to note is that it matters to us a great deal because North Africa and, and Middle East matter to us, but this was not about us. And that's a real change from, from the political discourse uh, in the Middle East over, uh, over many, uh, many decades. And as, as Jack Goldstone pointed out in the quotation I showed, you know, democracy is, is a messy business. And it's not just a question of the inherent time that it, uh, that it takes to develop a democracy. You have to remember these countries are starting out from a situation where the authoritarian rulers did not allow civil society to develop. Uh, Libya is the most extreme example, perhaps, where Qaddafi just didn't allow any institutions to, uh, to develop uh, whatsoever. So as, as far as the United States, is it going to make the conduct of foreign relations more difficult? I mean, absolutely. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, it's uh, no longer as easy as just picking up a phone, uh, talking to a, a foreign leader, and saying, this is what we'd like to do. Will you go along with it? Uh, parliaments have to be in, involved. There's more media scrutiny. Uh, public opinion has to be taken. Um, take into account. So these are all, um, you know, all complicating factors, but that's, you know, sometimes progress is, is complicated. That's one of the prices, uh, um, prices we all have to pay. And I, I wouldn't paint it in black and white either. I think there are a lot more opportunities for U.S. diplomacy. Um, certainly in Tunisia, there were, after the revolution, a lot more opportunities for, um, uh, for engagement. And also, a lot of the leaders are now people who, uh, who share our values. Uh, in the case of the president of Tunisia, uh, he was the uh, Mansef Mar Marzouki. He was uh, in exile in Paris for 10 years because he had been head of a human rights NGO in, in Tunisia. So there, were, there are a number of things where uh, he certainly agrees with, with US values and US um, and, and uh, U.S. policies. Some of the Libyan leaders were, were educated in, in the United States uh, as well. So it's, uh, there's some more complicating things, but there are also some things that makes the conduct of, of diplomacy a little, uh, a little easier. I think in the long run, open democratic systems, open economic systems are, uh, are to, are in our nation's interests and will make, uh, make it easier um, for us to, to advance our interests and, and the interests of folks at, uh, at home, but, um, but it, is, it is going to uh, take time. Let me just conclude by saying that the events of 2011 have really been, um, um, have really been historic and, you know, if you had, at the beginning of 2011, said that uh, you know authoritarian leaders such as Mubarak, Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, Gaddafi, and Mubarak would be gone from office in a short time, no one would have believed you. And uh, you know, so I think this is a positive development um, for them. It was very much game over. But uh, there's still a lot of uh, a lot of history to be written. Uh, hopefully, it will be written by the people and not just by isolated groups in these countries. And I think when we when we look back at 2011, with the benefit of a little more time, we'll see these events as just as much of a watershed uh, for the history of the Middle East and perhaps the world as the events of 1989 were for the people of Europe and, and for the rest of the world. So let me end there and invite any, um, any, questions, that, um, um, any questions that you may have, any comments. Uh, like I said, save all your hard questions for next week for Matt. And uh, I'd also like to draw your attention to um, a few pamphlets or flyers that I've brought about opportunities in the State Department. If, if you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to address those or, uh, or at the session at, at 4.15.
So over to you. Thank you. Now, too scary. He's leaving. Uh, too scary, right? <laughs> um, from my seat, I know you're rushing to get a question in. Uh, and then tell us your name and what you're studying. So we have about, about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, Scott Herrick, studying international relations. You went into it a little bit, but could you um, tell us a little bit more about why you think the only, the only, dicta the only people that have been deposed so far have been dictators, and that Monarchies have done a lot better at controlling the Arab Spring. Thank you. Well, I think that it, it's a good, um, good question. I think uh, in, in most cases, in, if you look at um, really at all the, at, the, at the Gulf monarchies, they've got the resources to, to apply to the problem. Um, they're also minority in the Gulf monarchies. They're to one degree or another uh, minorities in their own country. I, I don't know what the current population of Qatar is. It's probably a million, million and a half. Uh, probably closer to a million and a half. Uh, that might be understating it a little bit. But they're only about two hundred and fifty thousand Qataris. So, if you put the question, plus they have the highest GDP in the world per capita. So if you put the question to, to a guttery citizen, I don't mean to pick on gutter, it's just it's got the highest per capita, so it, it, exaggeration always serves to illustrate a point. Do you want democracy? Well, first of all, you know, if, you're, if the GDP per capita is over $100,000, that's not too bad. So you may not have that many grievances. Second of all, you've got an extensive social net Third of all, if you start talking about democracy in, in a country in which you, a guttery citizen or the minority, where does that end? I mean, does that mean democracy only for guttery citizens? Or how about people who've lived and worked there and built the society and the infrastructure for 20 or, or 25 years? So I think for, for a lot of those, the countries in the Arabian Peninsula, the monarchies in the Arabian Peninsula, there's not a large, large incentive to change, uh, change the status quo, and um, there's also, and again, to varying degrees. But I, I'd use the example of um, Kuwait here. Kuwait is certainly not a Jeffersonian democracy, but at the same time, the um, it's got a long history of a, of a parliament that, it, that stands up to, um, to the ruling family. It's uh, um, a parliament that can force a change of government. Not a, not a change in, I mean, the emir is still going to be the emir and lead the country, but there are, there are changes of, of government as, uh, um, as a result. They've got, by regional standards, a, a vibrant um, media scene. They also have a um, kind of a, a system of what, what they call diwania, where um, people go to one another's house and basically schmooze about politics um, every evening. So there's, there are avenues for, for the freedom of expression that did not, um, did not exist in a lot of these other countries. Uh, uh, that were that have seen these kind of changes. If we accept the, if you accept my premise that this was because of uh, all, a lot of this happened in many of the countries because of a, uh, a lack of dialogue and a loss of dignity, I think you would argue that many of the citizens, and I underscore the word citizens, in in the Gulf monarchies are there hasn't been that loss of dignity, and there's. There are opportunities for dialogue, even if they are not opportunities that we as American citizens would say are, are sufficient and that we would feel comfortable with. I don't mean to give them a pass. What I'm talking about is from, from their perception.
So race the mic. <laughs> you can go ahead and just form a line. Uh, I'm Philip Millard. I'm a Middle Eastern Studies major. Um, I was just wondering, from your perspective, what was going through your mind while you were over there being the ambassador to Tunisia while these things were happening? What, what, what were you thinking? What did you do to try to help the situation, things like that? Well, um, great question. The, th there were two, two aspects of um, what was going, going through our minds. Well, more than two. I mean, one was um, admiration for what, what was going on. Um, a lot of us at the embassy had worked in the Middle East for a number of years, and to see this kind of democratic movement um, really, you know, it, it was very, it was gratifying both, both professionally, but also personally as, as representatives of, uh, of the United States. The demonstrators, some of the demonstrators chanted, yes, we can, in English. If you had told me <laughs> before I went to Tunisia that there would be a demonstration in the Middle East where people were chanting, um, you know, chanting the phrase of an American president, I never would have believed you. And I don't mean that as a partisan comment because not only did they look up to President Obama, Senator McCain was, has been a very big, big ally of the transition in, uh, in Tunisia. So one was that sense of, of appreciation for what was going on. Um, a second aspect was there's a, um, when there's this kind of a, of a shift, there's always the question of the security and well-being of the American community, both the embassy community and the broader community. Now, we were um, fortunate there. As, as I said, the, the Arab Spring wasn't about us. We were pretty well positioned, um, I think, as far as our previous outreach to civil, civil society. And so as a result, th there wasn't an anti-American flavor to it. But still, I mean, there were, there were checkpoints in the city. And um, the day after Ben Ali fled, the airport was, was an absolute mess. It took 12 hours to get out. So you know, the question was, can we get our folks out if we needed to? We, were, we had worries about supply chain. Would groceries be delivered? You know, would people and all that? Would the electricity continue to be generated? Uh, so, in, and all those things turned out fine, but you don't, we didn't know that at, at the time. So there's a certain amount of um, attention we needed to pay to the security, and that was, that was very, since that was most important, that was, that was very time consuming. But then the, the w once we got past that hurdle, and, and we were fortunate because the security situation stabilized very, uh, very quickly, then the question became how could the United States take advantage of this really golden opportunity to help support um, the transition? And that's when um, um, we had the, the opportunity, we as the em at the embassy had the opportunity to be, uh, be creative and come up with, you know, come up with good ideas, um, bearing in mind fiscal, fiscal constraints back, uh, uh, back home. But um, you know, we, may, we were able to come up with a number of suggestions, which um, um, some, many of which were implemented, and so that was uh, that was gratifying as, as well. And we like to think that made a difference. Uh, so my name is Logan McDermott, uh, double majoring in Arabic and Middle Eastern Studies, and this is just a follow up to the previous question: How did the State Department decide, or like, what is the timetable of deciding how to respond to the revolution? And by that, I mean. At what point did you realize the revolution will be successful? At what point did you realize whether you should continue to support the previous regime or decide to support the opposition? Well, it wasn't really a question of um, supporting the regime. We had a pretty, we had a very unsatisfactory and, and pretty frosty relationship with the Ben Ali regime. It, there was no anti-American sense to it. He just. He, he had been Minister of Interior. That was his, his career path. He just didn't want anything to do with foreigners, and particularly with foreigners who were not shy to talk about things like human rights and, um, 
uh, and the rest. So it wasn't a question of, and, I mean, w well before the revolution, we had contacts with civil society, although those were constrained because there was, an, there was definitely a cost to Tunisians to be seen as being uh, in contact with us as far as uh, you know, being hauled into the Ministry of Interior for questioning or, or whatever. So they, they did that at, at no, no small risk to, uh, uh, to themselves. So there, wa there wasn't a question of, of whom to support, but you know, how, I, my analysis for what it's worth is that when Ben Ali woke up on January 14th, he had not decided to leave the country. Uh, and that's, that's based on both my conversations with extremely, s people are very, very close to him and also the open source documentation such as the interview with the pilot who flew him to, to Jeddah that day. So um, I, I think it was, it was it, I mean, the fact that the end was near was, was obvious, but I didn't wake up on January 14th saying, you know, I bet before I have dinner, Ben Ali will, will have fled. So I don't think he did either, though. Um, my name is Lindsay Gladden. I'm studying communication disorders. So what do you consider a, well, if you have a postmodern revolution, what would you consider a pre or modern revolution, and what are the main differences? Um, well, I think, they're going to ask me about social media, <laughs> if you're a communications major. Um, I think that in many other um, revolutions we've seen, um, and I'm thinking more of the 20th century, I think they've been more either national, well, more nationalistic or maybe more, um, you know, certainly we've seen a number of, of communist uh, revolutions as well. So. Um, for example, um, Russian Revolution with the uh, communist ideology, Chinese Revolution, you know, the kind of the mixture of, of communism and, um, and nationalism. Um, perhaps the same is, is true in Cuba. I've got less of a sense of, of the Cuban Revolution. But this was really not, there wasn't any ideology like communism, but nor was it really a question of, of nationalism. It was, it was really a desire to just get rid of the ruling family and, and, and move on. Hi, my name is Jessica Drivas. I'm pursuing a major in political science and a minor in Middle Eastern studies. Um, you mentioned that the United States um, quick uh, recognition mm -hmm. of the revolution really gave um, a lot of confidence to those who were pursuing that. Um, what, how do you think that the United States failure to really do that in the case of Syria, w as far as coming out with a really clear and strong um, position, will impact future relations? Future relations with the follow-on Syrian government, whatever yes. that is? Well, I'm not sure I'd agree 100% uh, with um, with your characterization of, of our uh, approach with the Syrians. I think Ambassador Ford has been um, so, so active with the Syrian opposition and at, at, at no small, um, small personal risk to himself that I, I think there will be an appreciation for, um, for his efforts. But at the end of the day, it depends what kind of what kind of government we we see? Is it going to be um, is it going to be a government that is uh, wants to deal with with the West in general and with the United States? Is it going to be more inward looking? Um, so and I think that will be more a more decisive factor than what perceptions are from leaders of the different factions of you know were we in their perception on their side. In, in time or not. Uh, last question. Uh, Warren Fraser, International Relations. Um, what sort of pol US policy changes do you envision would come out of the Arab Spring? I don't, 
I don't really see, um, I, I don't see policy changes coming out. Um, and the reason I, I say this is that what the United States is trying to do is support um, processes that lead to more transparency, both in the political systems and, and the economic systems. And those aren't, um, those aren't democratic policies or, or Republican policies. So I think that, um, rather I think they reflect what, what enduring U.S. interests are for the region because they're so integral to what US, what US values are. I mean, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, Senator McCain is an example of, um, of being a very strong proponent of, uh, of supporting the transitions in, uh, in these countries. So I don't think there'll be so much of a change in US policy. I think the change is we have a lot more opportunities to, to engage with the um, peoples and groups within within many of these countries, not within all of them, but within a lot. I mean, certainly from personal experience, the difference in Tunisia was was night and day, and um, I suspect to a lesser extent because the government wasn't as um, you know wasn't as uh, xenophobic, perhaps, and but. So to a lesser extent in Egypt, I suspect uh, that's true, where the Muslim Brotherhood was more interested in, in reaching out to us. And so I think we'll have a lot more opportunities. I think bigger question is going to be, what is our willingness as a nation to invest, invest our resources? And that's not just a question of, of the Middle East. That's a question of how engaged do we want to be in the world at large at a time when we've got, I mean, as we can see with the government shutdown, um, very serious differences and debates about, um, about the future, wh how or where and how our money should be spent. So to me, it's not so much the policies as much as the tools at, at the end of the day. Thank you. Sure. Great. Thanks. Thanks to all of you for coming. Have a nice afternoon. Uh, like I said, there are flyers in the back if you're, anyone's interested in State Department opportunities and happy to speak to you about them at 415. <laughs>